Welcome to the Cardboard Crash Course. My name's Ethan, and today is a very special day because I'm going to be teaching you how to play Twilight Inscription. This is Fantasy Flight's new epic roll and write experience from the Twilight Imperium universe. I'm going to be going through the components and all of the rules from start to finish so you can follow along in your own rule book, or if you don't have the game quite yet, just get excited for when that's coming in through the mail. If you want to win one just for yourself, all of my patrons do also get the opportunity to join to enter a giveaway down in my Discord server. Also, if you aren't already subscribed to the channel, I will be making faction guides for all of the Twilight Inscription factions, as well as continue making faction guides for all of the Twilight Imperium factions as well. They'll be a little bit shorter and a little bit easier to digest. But before further ado, let's go ahead and head on out and check out the box contents. The best and most exciting way to start a new board game adventure is by opening up the box and checking out the contents. So that's what we're going to do together. When you first open the box, you'll notice that you have both a rule book and a learn as you play guide. This is perfect for new players. We also have eight chalk markers to draw on the player boards, a sheet to represent Mechatol Rex, both for a group of players as well as solo, the speaker card to give to the first player, objective cards to represent public objectives, relic cards used in navigation and exploration, agenda cards to represent voting, asset reference cards to give to each player, double-sided to reference all of the different small intricacies throughout the game, 24, soon to be 25, faction cards representing all of the factions used in Twilight Imperium, an entire deck of different strategy cards to represent the changes throughout the game and throughout the galaxy, three black dice, three focus dice, and a whole plethora of player boards. These are what you're actually going to be writing on and using to play the game of Twilight Inscription. We're going to go ahead and start with the player setup. Moving into the actual player sheets you'll keep in front of you. We have Navigation, Expansion, Warfare, and Industry. You'll shuffle these and deal one each to each player playing the game. Arrange them like so, so that the names are closest together in the center of the board. Use the A side of the boards to represent a different experience for each player. But if you'd like a more competitive usage of these boards, flip all of your boards to the B side. The B side is the same on every single one of the boards and allows for a more competitive experience where everyone starts with the exact same setup. It's completely up to you as to which side you use. Next, we're going to choose our factions. In order to do this, we're going to shuffle the faction deck and deal three cards out to each player. That player then chooses one of the three to keep and returns the other two to the game box. If that card has a setup ability, as this one shows, go ahead and resolve that now. If instead you'd like to simply choose your factions, just go ahead and deal them out to each player, either a draft or freestyle. Next, we'll go ahead and place the Mechatol Rex sheet where all players can see. We're going to use this side in a game with three or more players, but we'll use the opposite side in a one or two player game. When you set that in the center of the table, also, shuffle up all of the Stage 2 agendas and deal one down below the Mechatol Rex sheet in the first slot. Then do the same with the Stage 3s and the Stage 4s. Next, we're going to create the Event Deck, which will represent the changes throughout the galaxy and throughout the game. Separate the Event Cards into 10 piles, 5 black and 5 blue, all with ascending or descending numbers. Over here, we're going to start creating the event deck by taking the highest number and placing the black card on the bottom. Then place the blue card of the same number on top of that. Repeat this until that entire number has been completed. Then continue on to the next highest number, starting with the black card once again. And we'll repeat this step until the entire event deck has been created, just as shown here. Then we'll go ahead and shuffle the Relic deck and place it here. And finally, for the Mechatol Rex setup, we'll choose randomly one of each of the colors of public objectives and place them in the color-coded areas as shown here. Finally, we'll place the black dice 
and focus dice near the Mechatol rec sheet and give one dry erase marker out to each player. Give the speaker card to the player who's most experienced and is best at reading things out loud. This is a double-sided reference card, and they keep this with them throughout the whole game. The game is played over a series of rounds, and each round represents the players taking their turns simultaneously. This is very unlike Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, and allows for no downtime. Each round, the speaker will flip over the top card of the event deck, reading the title as well as all the instructions allowed, representing everything happening in the galaxy up to that point. They'll spend the resources on the card, as well as the dice if the card tells you to roll the dice, to utilize their chalk markers and player board. Over on their player boards, the players will cross off, circle, and dash out assets in order to gain all kinds of benefits, including victory points. The player with the most amount of victory points at the end of the game wins. Strategy events, like the first event in the game, is going to be the most popular type of event throughout the game. They are always going to tell you to choose an active sheet, roll dice, and then spend resources. So we're going to choose the active sheet of the player board. When you choose an active sheet, that sheet becomes active for the entire round. You may not switch unless a faction ability tells you to do so. This is what you're locked into for the entirety of the rest of the round, so choose carefully. We'll spend the resources, as shown on the card, as part of step one. Then, we'll go ahead and roll all six dice at once. Always roll all six dice, even if players cannot use them. On these dice, we'll have different resources to utilize, just like the ones as shown on the cards. We'll spend the dice resources on that same active sheet that you chose earlier, before spending these resources. After the dice resources are then spent, the round ends and the speaker draws a new card once everyone is finished. The easiest way to understand this game is to walk through each of the four sheets individually. We're going to start with navigation, as it is the easiest one to understand. Up in the corner of each of these sheets, you're going to see how to utilize each of the assets that you gained from the cards and the dice. On the navigation sheet, you may either spend a pink or a green resource, the material or the research resources, to explore one adjacent system. Or you may spend a blue resource, which is called influence, to claim one explored system. In order to explore an adjacent system, you have to use your chalk marker to cross along this dotted line. You have to start from an, a system you've already explored and continue the orange line to explore the next adjacent system. You may even explore through wormholes. In order to do so, once you explore into that wormhole, you may come out on any other wormhole and explore that system instead. This is considered adjacent. But remember, you can only explore wormholes utilizing gravity drive, a technology. Technologies will ex be explained later in the video. Now, in order to claim a system utilizing that blue influence resource, we're going to circle an already explored system. An explored system is one that has the orange line connected to it, such as this one. In order to claim it, we're going to go ahead and circle around that system. When claiming systems, dotted lines around systems means that they are utilized immediately. This commodity would be utilized on the industry sheet, as explained later. But if you have a dashed line instead, like this one, you keep that until it's utilized. These double stars are victory points, pretty straightforward. The more you have at the end of the game, the higher your chances are to win. But systems like this, planets, Mechatol Rex, Warfare bonuses, and relics, as well as hero powers, will be explained later on in the video. And that's the entirety of the navigation sheet. Pretty straightforward. Next up is the expansion sheet. This sheet is slightly more complex, but it's not too bad, so I'd like to explain it next. In order to expand onto the planets that you've already claimed, you'll need to cross out one of the already claimed planet icons on the navigation sheet in order to cross out that planet icon on the expansion sheet. This represents developing a planet. To continue developing a planet, you must spend the resources that you get from the cards and the dice 
to cross out the individual resources on that planet. Shown here on Raron, we've completed this column. When you complete a column or a row, you claim that asset as shown in that column or row. This would be a technology. We'll notice on these planets that we have many similar things as to the navigation sheet, like hero powers, as well as commodities, or technology specialities. We also have a couple of new icons, such as the population and the counselors. And that is the entirety of expanding onto planets. The expansion sheet also shows a couple of different items. First is the space docks. In order to claim a space dock, you must either cross out a planet icon from the navigation sheet like earlier, or all of the resources. Once you do, you claim that focus die. Focus die will be explained later. The population track here is also shown on the expansion sheet. When you claim a population, you immediately circle the victory point to the lowest part of the population track. Every time you claim more population, you'll climb the population track and claim more and more victory points for the end of the game. The final thing shown on the expansion sheet is the resource tracker. This has no in-game purpose, but is very helpful for representing how many resources you may still have left in the round. You can erase them to show your own progress. Trust me, this is very helpful and helps me a lot every time I play. Next up is the industry sheet. I believe this sheet looks the most complicated, but trust me when I say you'll understand in just a moment. This sheet represents all of the expansion that you've done already and the industry that you've created on the planets that you've expanded to. You'll be scrapping as well as claiming different things on the industry grid here like commodities, hero powers, counselors, and focus dice, as we've seen before. In order to scrap a space, spend a pink material resource, and then cross out one unmarked space next to any marked space, just like this. In order to claim an unmarked space, you must spend either a blue influence or green research resource to claim any space next to a scrap space, such as this. Because it is a dotted icon instead of a dashed icon, we will utilize that commodity right away. In order to use the commodities that we've been getting from all three sheets, this sheet also has the industry chart. When you gain a commodity, you'll cross out the leftmost of that type of commodity. When you cross out all commodities of that column, underline the trade good value. If I did it once again here, I would underline the next one. If you cross out enough commodities to reach a victory point asset, then also claim those victory points. This chart is also where we'll be utilizing the counselors from earlier. Do the same as the trade goods and underline the leftmost counselor when you receive that counselor. If you reach the victory point asset, just like earlier, circle it. Trade goods and votes from counselors aren't gained right away. You'll need a specific event card similar to the one we're utilizing now in order to gain those in the trade goods or votes charts here. Two trade goods at the end of the game that are unused can be spent as one victory point instead, but other uses for these will be explained in a minute. Alongside the three resources, you may also spend technology specialities. A blue can create up to four material resources, a yellow can create up to three influence resources. A red can help you scrap into this area, claiming even double commodities. A green can be spent into this area. And these two areas will be different for each player board. That is the entirety of the industry sheet. Pretty simple. Finally, we have the warfare sheet. This represents the military force that you have and the results of conflicts with the two neighbors that you have your left neighbor, and your right neighbor, the people sitting on either side of you. This sheet is utilized in two different ways, both building units as well as deploying them on the war grid. To build a unit, you have to spend resources equal to the resource cost of that unit. So if I wanted to build a cruiser, I would need to, possibly over the course of multiple rounds, spend three materials as shown here. Not only would I claim that asset, but I would also be able to deploy that unit. In order to deploy a unit, it's shown the size of the unit here, and you may deploy that on the war grid. 
you have to deploy either adjacent to the battle line, which is the bottom most orange line, or adjacent to a unit already there. So as the cruiser is shown as a three wide section, I could build the three wide section right here. All units except for infantry are limited. So I would only be able to make up to three cruisers as such if they have a technology speciality instead spend that tech speciality in order to build. Infantry, like I said, are the only non-limited. You may spend either material, influence, or resources in order to build any number of them, and infantry are a single node wide. As far as dreadnoughts and war suns go, they are built in exactly the same ways. However, before being able to build them, you must spend a technology speciality in order to unlock it. They begin the game locked. When building on the war grid, if I were to build another cruiser, I may not build it over an anomaly as shown here. Anomalies block your deployment. But if I were to build it over an asset, I would claim that asset. And if it were victory points, I would keep them for the end of the game. That is the entirety of building and deploying units. Actual wars I will explain in more detail later in the video. Outside of strategy events that allow you to gain resources, we also have production events. Production events say claim one trade good on the industry sheet for each unlocked plus one trade good icon in your industry chart. If I had the three of these unlocked, I would claim three trade good assets, and then the round would end. Players can spend trade goods while resolving any strategy event card. A trade good is spent to provide any of the three resources on the active sheet. Alongside production events, we also have council events. When a council event occurs, claim one vote on your industry sheet for each plus one vote icon underlined on your industry chart. Right here, I have three underlined, so I would claim three vote assets. Each player does this simultaneously. Then, to actually vote on the agenda, the card shows you which stage we are voting on. This would be stage two, as found underneath the Mechatol Rec sheet. You would flip this, and the speaker then reads the pass effect and the fail effect aloud. Players will vote on either effect they'd like, and with how many votes they would like. In secret, each player would cross off and spend as many vote assets as they'd like. Here, I'm spending four. I would write it in the pass or fail category here, and then check off which one that I'm voting for. So in essence, I would be voting four votes for the pass effect. Players then reveal all simultaneously, and the effect with the most total votes between the players goes off, and it's explained right on the card. And that's the entirety of council events. The final type of event is a war event. A war event is done over the course of a few steps. First, you would advance the deployment line. In order to advance the deployment line, you would move this line up to the next most dotted line here. This would section off the first war, which would be in this area. This is the war that we'll be focused on for this war event. You would then total your power against each of your neighbors. This dotted line represents the breakoff point between each neighbor. So this section will represent your left neighbor, and this section would represent your right. Here, I have nine power against this neighbor, because the total value of my war sun and my infantry here covers nine nodes. And then this section with the cruiser and the three infantry covers six nodes. So I would write a six there. You would then compare the strength against each neighbor. So if my left neighbor here had more power than nine, I would lose and claim this asset. But if my right neighbor had less power than six, I would win and claim this asset. So in this instance, I got a negative one victory point asset from my left neighbor, and from my right neighbor, I claimed a planet asset. This section of the grid is not able to be built on anymore, as you must build above the topmost deployment line, and that war would be over. All right, now that we've taken a look at all of the different event cards and all of the different sheets, there's a few outlying things that I wanted to explain. First are these assets. This represents extra power against the neighbor on either side of you. 
If you were to claim this asset after exploring to it, you'd be able to gain plus one power in each upcoming war towards your right neighbor, and the same over here for your left. Also, on each of the sheets we have technology. When you choose an active sheet, you may claim any technology speciality assets from other sheets in order to cross off that, or you may spend the resources as shown here. Either way that you do it, gain this technology as an ability for the rest of the game. If it's a passive ability like Gravity Drive, it's always on, but if it's a per active ability, then you only gain it as a boost each time that you choose this sheet to be the active sheet. Another thing, we have focus dice down here. These are the colored dice that come into play. Natively, you may only spend the assets on the black dice, but you may unlock the focus dice to also gain these assets when you roll them. In order to do so, when you choose a sheet as the active sheet, just like technologies, you may underline that dice and spend the focus dice from another sheet or from this one. If you have a focus dice unlocked, like I have this red one, blue one, and green one on this sheet, when you choose this as the active sheet, you may spend those resources as well, even on the turn that you unlocked them. Another asset that we haven't gone over on this navigation sheet are relics. When you claim a relic asset, you flip the top card of the relic deck. When you do so, you put it next to your board and claim that many victory points as shown here, writing it next to that relic. Also, on top of that, you get the ability of this relic. Like this one, it says play immediately, and then you read it and gain that ability. But some of them are passive and continue throughout the game. Each player has access to up to two relics. Finally, we have Mechatol Rex. When you claim the Mechatol Rex asset, it represents you arriving at the Mechatol Rex Council. When you claim Mechatol Rex, focus on the Mechatol Rex sheet instead. The first player to claim Mechatol Rex writes their name here, and so on and so forth. When you do arrive there, you claim that many victory points and write it on the navigation sheet next to Mechatol Rex. You also immediately claim that many votes and write it on your industry sheet. This sheet also can show how many total votes that we have counted up for each of the agendas in the council events, as well as the final score totaled up at the end of the game. One final thing on the navigation sheet as well are the hero powers. This isn't just on the navigation sheet, but they are most prevalent here. The hero powers activate immediately upon claiming them. They're explained right on the faction card. And as long as we have faction cards in front of us, I would like to also explain setup and passive abilities. Setup abilities, as explained before, happen immediately as you claim this faction during setup. Passive abilities happen throughout the entire game. The Ghosts of Kreis allow you to do extra exploration instead of having to claim Gravity Drive on the navigation sheet. One last way of gaining victory points are public objectives. These are represented by the four cards we put next to the Mechatol Rex sheet at the beginning of the game. The first player to reach this goal as shown on each of the cards claims the higher victory point total. This is showing the lower victory point total that other players will get. Once the first person claims the higher victory point total, you'll flip the card and it'll only show that lesser value. How convenient. Once you also do collect that many victory points, let's say I was the second person, so I got four, I would then write it on the corresponding color sheet. For this objective, I would gain four points. You may only score each objective once, but you may score each of the four up to once. That's a lot of points to go after. The game ends when the speaker draws the A Throne for the Taking event card. This triggers the final war of the game, and then players add all of their totals of victory points together in order to determine the ruler of the galaxy. They write all of the victory points that they've claimed on each sheet in the sections available for them, and then add them to any objective points that they've gotten for that sheet. Once the players do this, they write their final total of victory points here, next to their name, whether or not they've claimed Mechatol Rex. The Winu got 29 points, the Sardak Nor got 58, the Ghosts of Kreis got 71, and the Federation of Soul got 73 victory points. 
which makes the Federation of Seoul the winners of this game. Congratulations, humans. Oh boy, <sighs> I'm a little parched. Well, there we have Twilight Inscription. It's, of course, a little bit less of a complex game than Twilight Imperium, but it is that experience shrunk down into a smaller version. The roll and write aspect really makes it fun because every player plays their turns simultaneously. I've never truly played a roll and write quite like this, so it was a great experience the first time. Stay tuned for a faction guides, quick little guides compared to the Twilight Imperium ones for all of the factions in Twilight Inscription. I'll be making them soon, so keep your eyes out. And of course, join to be a patron on the channel for all sorts of benefits, as well as winning a copy of your own as soon as this video is released. This is going on for a special Christmas giveaway, but patrons always get exclusive giveaways as well. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any comments or criticism, please leave them in the comments below, or join the Discord to let me know personally. I have so much fun making these videos, and I hope to see you next time. Pax Magnifica, Bellum Gloriosum.